Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the panel on, on 6G, uh, titled From Visions to the System Requirements. My name is Matti Latvaho. I come from University of Oulu, and I'm leader of 6G flagship Finland. Um, I will try to motivate you first a little bit to this topic of the panel before the presentations of panelists are, are shown to you. Um, if I share my screen. Hopefully you can see the slides now. So um, <clears throat> what we are actually seeing right now, right at the moment is a major transformation that mobile networks are, are pushing to the whole society when we are trying to connect, connect lots of different objects, things, processes to be part of uh, internet connected wirelessly. We are also introducing intelligence through different AI inspired algorithms and applications to enable our, our smart society of the future. Also, what we are seeing now is that there are different vertical application areas which are strongly coming into play and uh, might even be changing the technologies, um, uh, how technologies are developed in the future. For example, health, energy, industry, automotive sectors can play a significant role in defining future technologies. If you are taking a short look at different aspects which are influencing on 6G research and finally 6G uh, visions and, and system requirements, uh, I have categorized them to, to societal, business, security and technological uh, uh, areas. If you look at the societal challenges, I think when we look at the global situation right now, there are a lot of um, challenges around the world. And the um, United Nations has, has um, defined sustainability development goals already some years ago. And uh, <clears throat> when we look at all 17 of those, I think technologies and wireless technologies in particular have important role in trying to solve many of those. Businesses are changing due to introduction of new vertical applications. The, the underlying ecosystems and stakeholders are changing from the current mobile network operators dominated schemes. Security issues become much more crucial than ever before. We rely more and more on, on data and connectivity that wireless networks can provide. And uh, data privacy and security issues must be guaranteed in order to broadly uh, have acceptance for new technologies. There are lots of technological challenges for super efficient connectivity to, to increase the speed, reliability, latency, and also to introduce new sensing capabilities with radio signals. Artificial intelligence will play a role in optimizing the networks and, and radio connectivity schemes, as well as introducing complete new set of applications for the future. Global collaboration is always important in our field. Hopefully this geopolitical situation is, is not going to divert the world to, to separate standards. Hopefully this global standard is everybody's vision and hope for the future. With these words, I would like to introduce very quickly our panelists. We have a very interesting set of speakers today, represented by industry and uh, other uh, 6G programs. So we have Mikko Usitalo from Nokia Bell Labs, Pei Ying Xu from Huawei, Alan Carlton from Interdigital, Akihiro Nakao from University of Tokyo and Beyond 5G uh, program in, in, in Japan and Jan Söderström uh, from Ericsson representing the, the um, technology development in Silicon Valley and also Next Generation uh, Alliance based in the US. The first speaker today is Mikko. Mikko is coordinator for HexaX project, which is the European flagship activity in 6G. And, and he is managing the project uh, which is rather large and, and he will introduce the project to us in a minute. So hopefully you enjoy the panel and uh, after the presentations of panelists 
we will go through um, questions that the audience has and, and have hopefully a nice discussion this afternoon. Hello, I'm Mikko Ostalo, coming from Nokia Bell Labs, uh, Finland, leading a radio research team there. I'm also leading the European 6G flagship Hexa X, and uh, I would be happy to tell you more about this. So let me share my slides. So in Hexa X, uh, we have a vision to connect uh, uh, the three worlds, human, physical, and digital worlds, with the fabric of 6G key technology enablers. So humans are in the center. Humans need to control the physical world with efficient uh, connectivity and human machine interfaces. Models of humans are built uh, in the digital world uh, in order to, for example, carry out preventive healthcare. So uh, kind of um, recognize uh, heart attacks uh, before they happen. Uh, and then we need efficient connectivity between the digital and physical worlds to maintain um, accurate uh, models of the physical world to operate the physical world better. Based on this uh, vision and the trends, uh, we have identified. Hello, I'm Mikko Ostalo, coming from Nokia Bell Labs, uh, Finland, leading a radio research team there. I'm also leading the European 6G flagship Hexa X, and uh, I would be happy to tell you more about this. So let me share my slides. So in Hexa X, uh, we have a vision to connect. Uh, uh, the three worlds, human, physical, and digital worlds, with the fabric of 6G key technology enablers. So humans are in the center. Humans need to control the physical world with efficient uh, connectivity and human machine interfaces. Models of humans are built uh, in the digital world uh, in order to, for example, carry out preventive healthcare. So uh, kind of um, recognize uh, heart attacks uh, before they happen. Uh, and then we need efficient connectivity between the digital and physical worlds to maintain um, accurate uh, models of the physical world to operate the physical world better. Based on this uh, vision and the trends, uh, we have identified uh, six, 23 use cases that uh, need 6G, clustered them into five families. So one of the use case families is sustainable development uh, uh, here in the green circle, including, for example, methods to uh, obtain information to help with the sustainability goals. Then we have the use case family, massive twinning, containing uh, this uh, uh, massive scale model building, for example, of entire cities or industrial complexes in order to be able to better uh, design and operate those as well as have also preventive maintenance here. Then we have the use case family telepresence. So how could a human or set of humans, machine, set of machines, interact with each other independently of their location using all their senses and also interact with objects that don't exist anywhere in the physical world uh, but are in the digital world? Uh, and how could this be applied then in the context of uh, work or sports uh, culture gaming? Use case family, robots uh, to cobots. So how could we have a machine or set of machines uh, serve intelligently, collect information and uh, serve human or humans in their needs? Then the use case family, local trust zones uh, containing various uh, use cases, for example, related to uh, providing coverage in areas where there is no permanent network infrastructure. In addition to use case families, uh, we have also seven enabling services, for example, AI, artificial intelligence as a service. So uh, based on this work, uh, we have then identified uh, central research challenges, starting here from sustainability. So how could 6G be sustainable and how could 6G make other sectors of human life more sustainable? Network of networks, how could uh, different uh, hierarchical levels 
of uh, of the networks uh, uh, in different architectures coming all the way to the uh, network uh, next to human collecting information. Uh, how could we build this uh, all as a network of networks? Uh, and then connecting intelligence as a research challenge. How could we use AI ML as a fundamental base for the new generation? Trustworthiness uh, needs to be in the center of the design of the new generation right from the beginning as uh, more and more aspects uh, of uh, human life uh, get uh, uh, wireless and uh, get part of the digital services. Extreme experience uh, referring to how to carry uh, all the uh, central key performance indicators also from earlier generations uh, then towards the new challenges uh, for, for the next uh, 10 years or so. And finally, sixth research challenge global service coverage, two main dimensions. Uh, first related to sustainability, how to have the uh, access available to digital services uh, for all on Earth. And then also uh, how to uh, provide the uh, coverage no matter where one is located. Then how are we reaching these uh, all research challenges. Here we have the research challenges in the outer rim and in the center 5G and key technologies for 5G. So uh, for going to higher uh, capacities, we need to look at higher frequencies. Also at the same time, we need to be looking at uh, what could be done better and more on mid and low bands. Uh, localization sensing, how to use uh, communication systems for getting other information than communication and then how to have this AI ML as fundamental base and many others on which you will gradually get more and more information, for example, from the HexaX website. We have an excellent uh, consortium. Uh, as said, uh, so Nokia's leading Ericsson technical manager. We have uh, three top operators, uh, Orange Telefonica, Telecom, Italia. We have vertical Siemens uh, and other verticals in advisory group structure. Uh, and uh, then uh, high quality academia and uh, great uh, technology providers. We started beginning of this year running for two and a half years, so ending uh, mid-23 uh, and uh, hoping to set the foundation for 60 uh, during this time of 60 structuring and framing, uh, hoping them to be the base to build uh, for many projects to come, moving more towards the systemization halfway through the decade to standardization and end of the decade to commercialization. Thank you. That was a brief start on Hexa X. Thank you, Mikko. And uh, now we move to the second short presentation and um, it's coming from uh, Bei Ying Zhu, who serves as the senior vice president uh, of wireless research uh, Huawei Canada. Peying, go ahead. Hello, my name is Peying Zhu from Huawei. I'm currently leading 6G research. Thanks much to organize this panel and invite me for the discussion. Huawei has a virtual booth showcasing 6G vision and some early research on potential technologies. Yes. You are welcome to visit the booth for more information. I will highlight a few points here. From our perspective, 6G will go far beyond communications. 6G will serve as a distributed neural network that provides communication links to fuse the physical, cyber, and uh, biological worlds, leading to an era in, in which everything will be sensed, connected, and intelligent. Some of key features are highlighted in this diagram. AI machine learning can be used to improve network performance and automate network operation and management. This is what we call the AI for network. With 6G, network nodes, including terminals, will have built-in AI computing capability. This can be leveraged to provide distributed learning. And this is what we call the net for AI. Native AI will support both AI for net and net for AI functions. With the use of massive MIMO beamforming, high frequency and a wider spectrum, integrated communication can turn 
a cellular system into a networked sensor. To explore the physical world through radio wave transmission, echo reflections, and scatterings. Native AI and networked sensing are two key features differentiating the 6G, 5G. These two features naturally fit together. Native AI can be utilized to extract knowledge from sensed data, while sensed data can help AI and machine learning. Extreme connectivity activity will provide truly immersive multi-sensory multimedia user experience and provide a full-scale support for Industry 4.0 use cases with integrated and non-terrestrial network, six will be able to connect unconnected. The native trustworthiness support is a must for new network architecture. This includes new data governance architectures, supporting data compliance and monetizing, as well as advanced privacy protection and quantum attack defense technologies. Finally, green and sustainability should be the guiding principle when designing 6G. Not only power efficiency for data transfer, but the total power consumption, including computing, should be considered. Comparing with the previous generations, we see 6G a game changer in many aspects for service, in addition to connectivity, sensing will enable many new use cases. For networking, both private and public network will be natively supported instead of extending public network to support private network. For security, native trustworthiness is enabled by New technologies such as distributed ledger and a multi level trust model, and so on. For algorithm, hybrid data driven and analytical design will be used to significantly improve the network performance. For OEM, it will be fully automated. For coverage, integrated and non terrestrial network nodes were provided truly ubiquitous coverage. For business, 6G will be a platform for both networking and computing. To realize the vision of 6G, it is crucial to have well-defined KPIs in addition to high-level requirements. We don't think that 6G should be simply an order of magnitude improvement of KPIs over the previous generations. New KPIs for new capabilities such as sensing, distributed intelligence, and computing needs to be introduced to reflect the new capabilities. Evaluation methodologies are also needed. In terms of frequency spectrum, it seems that it is given that 6G will use higher frequency, even terahertz. However, we believe that sufficient low and mid-band spectrum are needed for 6G globally. ITUR process has, has been very successful to develop visions, requirements, and evaluations for previous generations. We believe this is a good model for 6G as well. Early, in, early engagement of other industry research organizations Etc. towards the definition of 6G vision and the requirements will be crucial. 5G will continue to evolve to support, better support verticals and so on. 6G should aim to open new services beyond 5G's capabilities. In terms of timeline, we expect that 6G should be available around 20. 30. Thanks.
Thank you, Pei Ying. And now we move to our third um, introductory presentation from Ella Carlton, who serves as Vice President for Wireless Labs in the Digital UK. So, Alan, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Carlton, and it is a pleasure to be here today participating in this panel. In my role at Interdigital, I am responsible for wireless and networking R&D activities in Europe, where our focus remains 5G and its evolution, but of course, 6G is very much on our radar too. Here, we are involved in several collaborations that are all exploring the big question, what is 6G? I've been in the wireless business for quite a while, and I've worked through a few of these generational inflection points. In my experience, they've all played out very similarly. There are some, these are some of the lessons I have learned and are what basically frames my thinking about 6G. Every generation begins like it is now with a lot of hype and hope for something new, some new big thing, but most often this next big thing is in fact some old thing that has just found its right time. Of course, TDMA, CDMA, OFDMA uh, are all examples of this. In the same vein, this industry that we all work in is quite conservative and moves quite slowly, much slower than we might dream. Rarely are industrially unproven technologies selected for inclusion in an XG standard. A mistake often made is also to think of the next G as something way out in the future when we might see it deployed for real. This is the wrong way to think about it. We do not have that long. For 6G, what is in it, what is included in most part will be decided around 2025 when standardization begins. If the technology you're working on is not mature, is not already picked up by IEEE, Etsy, or some other incubatory standards organization well before then, then it will not likely make the cut for selection in at least the first round of the next uh, of the 6G standard. While new use cases and KPIs serve as main drivers, it is weaknesses in the current standards technologies that serve equally to shape the future. The biggest weakness in, in, in 4G was the core network design, and this has been radically overhauled in 5G. I would expect to see much more happening here as well. Lastly, uh, beware requirements fatigue. How many of us have glazed over when presented with the 5G requirements pyramid? I'm sure we'll get a new defining hexagon or maybe an octagon of some sorts when 6G solidifies, or perhaps easy to say with hindsight, all the innovations in 5G can be relatively easily explained as answers to the simple question I state here. What was the best way to make wireless more flexible, reliable, lower latency and energy efficient? 6G will be the same. In terms of vision for 6G, I have to tell you mine is a fairly simple one that flows from a deep understanding of the revolution that 5G is. We may not be all the way there yet, but we are certainly on this track. As mentioned, our industry does not typically move enormously fast, but in the transition from 4G to 5G, the mold has truly been broken. The basic design model paradigm has changed from a rigid, single use case, a telecom based design model to a new flexible many use cases and an increasingly IT based design model. History may remember 5G's crowning accomplishment as opening this door, but on this path 5G will only take us so far. 6G will take us further and will be an evolution in this new path that has been established by 5G. One more thing that is common across generations are the levers that we have available to create something new. There are only ever three. Number one, spectrum and how it is used. There remains a lot of work to be done here with lots of improvement potential, but how this is accomplished will be very dependent on levers two and three. Then there is cellular architecture innovation. This includes everything from new channel codes, new MIMO to small cells. In my opinion, cells simply cannot get any smaller and we're on the inevitable path to a cellless model, if not beyond 5G, uh, then certainly in 6G. The last lever is what I call the qualifying technology du jour or the qualifying technologies du jour. These are the key technologies that are available and are mature enough to be leveraged and considered at the start of standardization. Historically, an old technology like OFDM would fit the bill here. This tech was actually originally proposed at 3G, but chip technology was not ready for it until, uh, until 4G. And of course, today, the headliner qualifying technology for 6G is AIML, 
And possibly uh, the simple big 6G question is, what are the best ways to apply AI ML to make wireless even more flexible, more reliable, lower latency and energy efficient? A few words on use cases. There are many being touted, but two basically sell the 6G need best for me. The first one is truly immersive XR. Many challenges exist in the mass realization of this technology, but I do believe with the proliferation of edge compute power, these will be overcome. This roadmap is very rich, and over time, the user experience data rate of 5G will simply not be enough. The second one that makes me a believer is the connected industries and automation family of use cases. Much as 5G talks about enabling these use cases, and it will to some extent, nobody really asked these industries what they needed from wireless at the beginning of 5G. This is all different now. And through forums like the 5G ACIA, real requirements are emerging in areas like latency and reliability that go well beyond 5G. These use cases and others are driving the definition of 6G. The ITU has only just begun this requirements consensus building process and it will be years before they are formally agreed. In my view, these KPI will look something like this slide with step jumps in user data rates, lower latency and reliability. These, these numbers come from my H2020 and Power project referenced here that is an EU-US collaboration around establishing a common 6G roadmap vision and position. These requirements will all demand uh, profound innovation, uh, much like 5G did across the complete wireless stack. And this is what will take us to 6G. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, next on the queue is Akihiro Naka, who is professor at University of Tokyo and is is key person in international collaboration in Japanese Beyond 5G Promotion uh, Consortium. Go ahead, Aki. My talk title is Beyond 5G Strategic Directions in Japan. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm uh, serving as a special advisor to the president of the University of Tokyo right now but I'm a professor uh, teaching at the Department of Systems Innovation School of Engineering, the University of Tokyo. So as you can see from my profile, uh, I'm uh, serving as a chairman of various uh, committees at uh, Japanese government or government affiliated organizations. For example, Beyond 5G Promotion Consortium, uh, chairman of an international committee, and the Network Architecture Committee of 5G MF, uh, 5G Beyond 5G Committees of uh, Space ICT Forum. So uh, let me talk a little bit about our strategic uh, uh, planning uh, towards the Beyond 5G in, in Japan. So in June 2020, the strategic proposal for a 6G R&D has been summarized by the Beyond 5G Strategic Board held by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications in Japan. And accordingly, uh, in December 2020, Beyond 5G Promotion Consortium has been established. This is the web page, and you can find out more detail uh, in this page if you would like to uh, know more about it. So the structure uh, of uh, this uh, Beyond 5G Promotion Consortium is, is the following. So this consortium was established as an organization to strongly and actively promote the Beyond 5G promotion strategy uh, through collaboration between industry, academia, and government. So this uh, consortium uh, consists of two committees under general meeting, uh, planning and strategy committee. And uh, so this uh, committee uh, is in charge of study of a comprehensive strategy to promote Beyond 5G and the preparation of a Beyond 5G white paper. So we have just started uh, to uh, write a white paper uh, with the major players in industry and academia, uh, but we are waiting to see the first draft uh, anytime soon. And a second committee under general meeting, uh, which I'm uh, serving as a uh, chairman of, 
Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, committee uh, is in charge of uh, grasping international trends uh, for the promotion of Beyond 5G and also dissemination of Japan's efforts to the uh, international community. So uh, we have uh, several other uh, organizations uh, like uh, 5GMF, uh, Beyond 5G New Management Strategy Center, and the Beyond 5G R&D Promotion Platform, uh, which is, is like a test bed to test out our Beyond 5G technologies. And also within the ministry, a Beyond 5G Promotion Task Force uh, was formed to uh, uh, discuss the uh, relevant uh, uh, questions and challenges in uh, Beyond 5G R&D. So the key features for Beyond 5G that we identify are seven directions. So the first, uh, you know, uh, the category, uh, the three blue boxes uh, is the direction uh, to pursue the further upgrade of 5G features, ultra fast and large capacity, ultra low latency and ultra numerous connectivity. But down below, uh, there are four directions in orange boxes uh, which has new features uh, contribute to uh, generate uh, sustainable and new values. The ultra low power consumption, ultra security and resiliency, and autonomy and scalability. I per I'm personally interested in autonomy and scalability, especially scalability part, because uh, it's, uh, it has a great impact on the consumer market because we, we have to be able to extend the reach of the mobile network uh, to the isolated region and and uh, also like uh, oceans and space. So in accordance with the strategies, the mix R&D measures towards beyond 5G is the following funding. The next generation mobile communication technology beyond 5G is expected to become the main infrastructure of all industries and societies in the 2030s. So it is important to establish beyond 5G key technologies at the earliest in the perspective of international competitiveness and national security. So this is the reason why they prepared beyond 5G R&D fund. And to enhance the R&D uh, of key technologies necessary for smooth realization of beyond 5G, NICT will launch beyond 5G R&D fund to grant R&D projects of research organizations in Japan, such as private companies, universities, and make use of core facilities, test beds by said organization to promote the public and private sectors R&D. So they allocated uh, five, 500 million US dollars approximately. And among, it, among that, so 300 million US dollars is allocated for a beyond 5G R&D fund, which is granted to uh, universities and private companies. And uh, 200 million US dollars is allocated for core facilities for beyond 5G R&D, which is a test bed utilized by uh, universities and private sectors. So NICT uh, published a white paper of Beyond 5G recently. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, here is the big picture. You know, in order to solve the social issues, the applications on top of enablers, which consists of a cyber physical control plane and a physical space and server space. So we have a bunch of uh, new technologies considered in physical space and cyberspace. So if you're interested, uh, you can go to this website to check out the detail. We established Collaborative Research Institute for Next Generation Cyber Infrastructure. Director is myself, and it was established in April this year. So our mission is to promote research and education on 5G beyond 5G through all areas of studies, including science and humanities, so we establish a interdisciplinary collaboration among 12 schools and institutes at the University of Tokyo. So we have three pillars, experimental study on the Beyond 5G testbed and fundamental research across the six areas. And the last uh, area six is interesting one. So we deal with the data governance and the policy making and Beyond 5G strategies. And the other uh, uh, five areas, area one to area five, are perfectly aligned with uh, uh, our 
all Japan's strategy are determined by uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. And the last one is education. And for education, we think that the remote cross appointment is important. So if we invite uh, distinguished researchers uh, through this remote cross appointment system that we uh, newly instated. And we gave uh, uh, distinguished researchers a new professorship called Global Fellows. We think the key driver to promote uh, this type of uh, uh, you know, remote cross appointment and overseas uh, uh, collaboration is a government to government joint funding for international collaborations. And we call the, the bi directional globalization. You know, we find a global market for uh, established technologies. And, but at the same time, we'd like to invite uh, people from outside uh, in Japan. Uh, to co-create new values. According to my own experience, establishing an individual human relationship is, is very crucial for international cooperation. This is my last slide. In summary, in my talk, the, uh, I point out the R&D of Beyond 5G cannot be realized within a single country, so we maximize the opportunity for international co-creation of the next generation cyber infrastructure and by directional globalization is a necessity, thus we are eagerly uh, looking for collaboration partners. According to my own experience, establishing individual human relationship is very crucial for international collaboration for defining the next generation cyber infrastructure. The last key driver is the G2G joint funding for international joint projects. Thank you for your attention. This is the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Aki. Last but not least, we have Jan Söderström coming from uh, Ericsson US, who is serving as Vice President and Head of Technology Office, Silicon Valley. Go ahead, Jan. Hi, I'm Jan Söderström. I'm Head of Technology for Ericsson in Silicon Valley, reporting to our group CTO. But I'm also um, the vice chair of the Next Year Alliance, and it was partly in that capacity that I was asked to join this uh, panel today and discuss the path to 60 and what the Next Year Alliance is all about. So I'll start in the Next Year Alliance end, and then I'll share some of the Ericsson visions for 60 at the end. The Next Year Alliance was set up late last year. It came on the initiative by Addis that uh, organized the discussions between industry partners and with the government partners to discuss the need from a North American perspective of what to do for the next 10 year uh, time frame in terms of building strength for North America beyond 5G. So we created this initiative uh, and the reception has been enormous as you can see on this list uh, in this chart many 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 companies well well over 40 that have signed up to join this initiative. And it's quite exciting to see all these brands uh, working together. Uh, I mean, this is everything from chipset to cloud, from devices to applications and everything in between. Um, and in many ways, I think this um, ecosystem represents something unique you know, also on the global scale, where we will be able to sort out things um, for, for in the 60 timeframe that maybe hasn't been done before. So that's also why um, we at Ericsson are very excited to be part of this. So there are some fundamentals in, uh, in the Next Year Alliance in, in this laying, uh, laying the foundation. It's definitely a private sector initiative. Um, for the US government, it was very important not to have this top-down uh, government initiative that doesn't fit with the American um, business climate. So they were very appreciative when the industries together uh, formed this to themselves and, and brought this up to the government to, to drive this. But of course, we intend to influence and, and, uh, um, what the government do in terms of policies and, and funding, etc for building um, uh, storage over 60. Uh, in the beginning, of course, getting uh, funding for 60 research at uh, universities and, and other research uh, in, uh, institutions. Um, nearly 50 members from industry and academia. Um, and um, we have a 
now launched the technical program. Um, of course, in the beginning, it takes a bit of time to get going, but now we are in full swing. Uh, the work groups are formed and the elections are done and the first contribution is coming in. Um, so now we're coming to the real uh, key part of, of the Next Alliance work. Um, so, of course, the proof is in the pudding. But from what we see so far, this initiative seems to have to have a lot of the um, fundamentals to really do difference uh, towards 60. Uh, it is across uh, uh, well-balanced leadership across the industries. Uh, we have leaders in all levels. So on the top level, we have the full members group, which is the board, uh, chaired by Andrew Fewich, CTO um, and president of AT&T Labs at AT&T. Uh, myself as the vice chair. Uh, un and uh, under the full member group, we have the steering group, uh, which is where most of the technical and operational decisions are being handled. And here we have a, a co-chair model with three co-chairs, Divaki Chandra Muli from Nokia, Brian Daly from AT&T, and Benoit Peltier from VMware. So you can see already here, we have a good breadth of uh, uh, industry cross-sections. And when we look deeper into the uh, working group, etc., we see uh, representative of all, uh, all parts of the, uh, of the ecosystem. So that was the next year alliance. Um, I just want to end up with a couple of slides from, from Ericsson, what we see uh, towards the 60 world of 2030. And we talk about technology journeys shaping the future. And basically we have four um, use case areas on the top and we have four technology areas in the bottom, um, which form sort of what the 6G will be about. Internet of senses. So today we already have virtual reality, but we started to add haptics to that. And we can see more and more sensory expression being uh, added to, to um, the capabilities. Connected intelligent machines. We see some of that already in 5G, but uh, for real low latency and real intrinsic uh, capabilities, uh, we'll see more coming up in 6G. Digital twins and a programmable physical world um, is the third area. Uh, it's, it's nascent and, and coming already now, but in, in the 2030 timeframe, we think this will be a central area. And the fourth, uh, of course, uh, with all the carbon footprint going down and the change of the energy systems, etc. Uh, the networks will be critical for be creating the connected, sustainable world. Um, the supporting technologies, connectivity, of course, radio fixed, uh, security and trustworthy systems, systems that can be trusted, not only for security purposes, but also that they always work. AI in, um, in use for having cognitive network and, and, and uh, intent-based networking, etc. And uh, finally, the network compute fabric. Um, that will um, uh, build new capabilities in, into the intrinsic network, not only the network connecting into a cloud, but actually having a, a, a combined um, platform across the players. So I'm gonna end with this one. This is about my day job. I run something called D15 in, in Silicon Valley, which is our co-creation lab. And it is about uh, letting the applications and the tech players uh, use the 5G platform for innovations. Uh, and for 6G, I think this will be even more important. 6G will be defined by its use cases. And test beds and experimentation with ecosystem will be central to get that input. And, and um, our piece of the puzzle in Silicon Valley is the D15 lab. So that's what I had looking forward to the continued discussion in the panel. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, everybody. So let's let's start now this discussions part. And uh, if we start from reflections, how we understand and see five G today, and how six G might be developing on top of that, let's start from from regulation related issues and, and how 5G started to slightly change the, for example, spectrum regulation by introducing, for example, local 5G network operation concepts. How do the panelists see this type of spectrum regulatory 
uh, uh, James is painting the 6G landscape. Who would like to start from this? Maybe Aki, I know that you are active in this field. Maybe you can start. Okay, uh, thank you, Mati. Okay, so uh, in Japan, we have local 5G uh, spectrum uh, allocated for, uh, we call it local 5G, but in other countries, it's called a private 5G. But it's a uh, very same thing. But we allocate this uh, you know, radio frequency band for uh, people who are not uh, involved in the uh, development and also servicing the uh, the 5G yet. So regular people like us, like uh, university teachers, uh, local governors, government, government governors, and also uh, some um, companies are related to uh, telecom uh, operator business. So they can all apply for a license ban and do their own uh, uh, 5G uh, uh, radio service uh, for themselves. So I view this as, as a great uh, opportunity for uh, innovating in the next generation uh, uh, mobile network because you know we can include everyone in the loop so that we can co-create a new way of using uh, uh, radio frequency and also creating new services. So uh, in terms of uh, your question, Mati, I think uh, regulation uh, should uh, be more open to like uh, local uh, usage of the frequency band, like local 5G. Uh, we, we should promote uh, more like private 5G and local 5G so that uh, we can uh, develop a new way of using uh, this uh, mobile networks or uh, some other you know uh, interesting application that we have not foreseen yet. So i like to start with this uh, uh, answer, uh, and maybe uh, anyone can uh, follow up on that. Yeah, maybe I can make an, I can add something to that, uh, Matty. You know, I find this discussion very similar to you know the start of five G when there was grand promises of uh, much more diverse uh, utilization of well player diversification in the use of spectrum, and in that respect, I think coming back to your original part of the question, 5G has been a disappointment in, in that sense. Uh, there's not been uh, much diversification uh, globally uh, in terms of, you know, who have been the, the owners of Spectrum and what have you. Um, but my biggest disappointments in, in, in 5G and, you know, I, I often argue, you know, is, is, is the slow uptake of millimeter wave technology, uh, you know, and, 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 and those Spectrum. And, and, and that might actually be a function of the the crazy COVID world uh, we live in today, um, where basically it was really assumed the business case for millimeter wave spectrum was going to be, you know, uh, worked out through entertainment venues and and stadiums, and that hasn't quite happened yet. So, in my in my view, there's there's much, you know, there's a lot of talk going into six G and further spectrum innovation, but there has to be even more business model innovation. And, and we have to come up in the journey from 5G to 6G into different uh, neutral host type models and, and other permutations uh, so that we can all share the burden uh, of, of deploying uh, even higher frequency spectrum and, uh, and the like. So I think uh, on the journey to 6G, it's only, it's only going to become more and more important that we, 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 we get a lot more clever uh, not just technically, but from a, a business model perspective as well, when it comes to spectrum innovation. I can I can uh, follow up. I, I agree with, with what maybe heard from, from Alan and, and, and from Aki. Um, I think one thing with 6G though is uh, we need to think about is is performance. We all expect much much more performance. So in spectrum, I think we should also allow for um, advanced spectrum management technologies that will actually take you make use of different frequencies, different bands uh, on the on the fly. So, um, so we actually can get the the performance that people will be expecting out of 60. So um, even if uh, we should have a, a local spectrum and we should have more players coming in, we must also allow for players to also um, optimize performance uh, using 
spectrum everywhere where they can find spectrum. I think um, it's going to be scarcity, of course, of spectrum here. So uh, it's one, just one one additional angle to what we heard. Okay, so now <coughs> started to talk about spectrum. Um, now everybody, of course, in in research community is talking about terahertz communications. But what is your opinion on real uh, possibilities and meaning in practice, taking into consideration the network density challenge and transceiver energy consumption density, possibly when moving to towards 300 gigahertz uh, spectrum band? So how realistic that seems to be right now, based on your findings so far? Who would dare to start? Um, yeah, Martin, so, maybe you can uh, I can uh, uh, say a few words on this one. Sorry, I did I. Yes, yes, yeah. please, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I I think uh, um, uh, just coming toward uh, like the, the uh, after your discussion about the frequency, I think uh, for six G, uh, we're still looking uh, into that uh, we need a, a multi layer of uh, um, different frequency band, including the. Uh, low band, uh, mid band, and uh, uh, high frequency band. But the uh, terahertz, uh, probably it's uh, from our perspective, it's a kind of a supplement uh, um, band to enable a certain type of uh, application. For example, if you want to um, enable uh, high resolution sensing imaging, uh, terahertz is actually a very good uh, candidate. All the uh, short a range uh, device to device communication and so on. So we see this as a, a supplement uh, um, band, uh, not necessarily the uh, the, uh, the major global band. So we need a, still need to uh, look into a globally available um, lower band for the 6G. Nico, you want to continue? Yeah, so quite much uh, agree here. So now we are at the stage of uh, understanding that for what do we need 60 and uh, how much uh, uh, kind of performance we expect to need from that. And uh, then like, um, uh, then look at all the possible ways uh, how to contribute to this. Uh, and it is important to look at uh, all the like uh, low bands and uh, mid bands. Also, for example, spectrum between uh, 7 and uh, 20 four gigahertz that was uh, excluded at the early stage of uh, 5G. But yes, certainly it's uh, also very relevant to look at uh, uh, the extreme performance uh, from like between 100 and 300 uh, gigahertz. Uh, and it, it is possible to re reach uh, like uh, um, good uh, uh, coverage there as, as well. So it's uh, not, not just a very short range. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, like uh, what, what the ultimate uh, performance there will be in the end uh, remains to be seen and also how much uh, that is needed uh, remains to be seen. But it, it's a very relevant research question now for 16. If I, if I, can, if I can just add to that, uh, as I say, I, I, I'm personally a little skeptical of any serious application, even in the 6G timeframe above 150 gigahertz. I think we should focus much more of our industry and in, uh, research energy and in, in, in leveraging everything below 100 gigahertz as much as as much as we possibly can. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, there is there's an enormous amount of work still to be done in, in the area of, of uh, spectrum sharing and leveraging, you know, uh, you know, you know, lower frequency bands much, much more efficiently. Um, yeah, I, one thing I was chatting to a colleague the other day, there's a lot of uh, discussion around joint comms and sensing uh, type um, uh, the type technologies in, in 6G. But uh, when I look at that technology, I think it actually might be less a niche sort of service technology, but more critical in terms of exploring a, um, a you know, new spectrum sharing approaches in the, the automotive band, for example, where there is, uh, you know, huge amounts of spectrum, five gigahertz plus uh, sub uh, 28 gigahertz uh, space. And if we could invent something in our industry that would allow automotive radars and cellular to work together, uh, that's a huge uh, chunk of spectrum that could uh, deliver a lot of value in 6G. Any other comments on this? Can I add a few words to uh, what Alan said? Sure. Um, so I agree, you know, 
uh, to uh, Alan's uh, view over, you know, the very high frequency band is very hard to use. So in my lab, I taught my students to, you know, measure the uh, uh, performance and uh, also power of the 60 uh, gigahertz uh, band to 100 gigahertz band. And what we found is, is, is that only a few uh, meters, like 10 feet, three meters, uh, is and even even shorter than that if you want to find a stable communication. So it's like a one meter. So in this sense, as uh, Mari pointed out, you know, density problem, you know, you have to think about a new way of designing the uh, base station in this case, because clearly we have to use uh, a distributed antenna or some other method like a metal material uh, to convey the, you know, this a very high frequency band signal over to the users. So I'm not against using the high frequency, but we have to think a new way of uh, how to use this uh, high band. At the same time, uh, someone pointed out that we have to think about how to use a low frequency band also. And um, I, I guess Alan pointed out that the OFDM uh, was introduced uh, way before uh, you know, 5G. I agree. And, uh, Maybe you know we have to find a way to non-orthogonal frequency division matrix, and like you know, some researchers are looking into this. You know, we have to rethink the way that we use the low frequency band, and maybe we can find a you know wiser way to use the low frequency band because we know that low frequency is is over uh, crowded right now. But maybe we we can find a way to. Uh, we use that uh, low frequency band. At the same time, uh, we have to find a way to combine the high frequency band and uh, low frequency band. Maybe we can connect sub six gigahertz, uh, you know, the radio uh, with the very short range, uh, you know, uh, the base station. You know, we can carry it like a very short range uh, uh, base station with, I mean, with us, like you know, people, something like that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, move smoothly from this spectrum discussion to to users' acceptance of next generation technology. As we all remember, uh, there were lots of riots all around Europe against 5G because of uh, hooliganism, maybe, but also there were real uh, um, people were really scared about millimeter wave technologies and beamforming technologies. And uh, now that we are talking about even higher, much higher frequencies, um, we are actually throwing gasoline into the fire to that kind of group of people. So is there anything that we have learned from resistance against 5G now that we are starting to think about how 6G will build up? Anyone would like to comment on that? Or would we do something differently or or how to, how to try to avoid that? At least uh, open uh, discussion uh, and uh, trying to focus the discussion to facts and uh, having all the, all the stakeholders uh, in, the, in the process uh, as, as early as can uh, certainly should contribute towards the positive. I, I would agree with that. It's I think this we could do a, a much better PR job as an industry in terms of educating people. I I, I really don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe we have an EMF indicator on phones or something like that. You know, <laughs> or some, something comes out. But uh, I, I think that would just be token. I think I think we just have to you know, uh, yeah, um, you know think about the, the users up front. And I, I do suspect that six G will be much a more a much more consumer targeted um, technology than 5G perhaps has been, um, which has been more industrial focused and uh, it will be really important to bring people along with us. I mean, the fact, fact resistance is everywhere, right? Not only in our industry, so it's, it's challenging for vaccines or whatever, right? So it, it, is, it is a tricky question. Um, I think one thing to think about is that people actually um, get some benefits out of each of the technology. I mean, people got uh, 
got internet on their phones with 4G. I think most people do appreciate that. And, um, I think we need to think about for 5G and 6G, what would the general public see as the benefit they would actually get from this? So we get more of a positive spin on what they get from technology than just a scare or things that are they think are dangerous or taking away things from them. So I think um, it's difficult to win over some of these people uh, with just information because information is there and people don't want to always read it. But if we can win them over with the actual benefits of how it improves their lives, I think that can um, maybe balance up um, this, this uh, unfortunate situation. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, I once uh, uh, saw a study uh, that that was uh, uh, back when people had a concern about the Wi-Fi. You know, you have access uh, point at home everywhere, so there's uh, also this uh, EMF concern. There was a study actually um, look at all this uh, um, emission. I was really surprised to find out the 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 the, the, the you know the, the device gave uh, more. Uh, EMF is the, you know, the power charger, the adapter. Actually, we have everywhere in the house. Those are even uh, are worse things, but people don't really understand. So I, I think I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Miko, even, even though we are working in this uh, um, field, but uh, even us, uh, we, we, we don't really uh, uh, truly, uh, you know, uh, well equipped with the knowledge. So uh, then it's hard to uh, even convince the normal people. So I think uh, we definitely need um, better, uh, you know, uh, education, information sharing and all those things, uh, or, or including our uh, KPI. That's why I think uh, for 6G, we have to make it clear from day one, we're looking to this uh, total power consumption on all those things. Okay, so let's let's stay still a little bit in this this larger uh, audience acceptance to to next generation technology. As five G has already started to show the road towards the future, that it will really be critical part of society's infrastructure. It will be part of every single modern digital service uh, within a time, and uh, therefore. I think it might be justified to be really concerned about security and privacy related matters. How can we this resolve that kind of, of concerns from bigger public? And are there any, any specific directions that you as lead researchers in different fields would, would recommend research community to look at right now in this respect? We, we are, it's, I mean, we are already on to that, of course, 5G is already more security bottom-up built in, right, uh, than, than, than 4G was, which was a little bit more bolt-on. At the same time, we, we are adding much more devices and attack surfaces, so it's a, it's a constant battle. We have added things in 5G that's not network slicing, for example, that would allow for different protocols and, and security schemes for different user groups, which is also why um, this technology can be used by not only for, for consumer needs, but also for national infrastructure and so on. So there are, of course, already in 5G things that are uh, coming in that can be used uh, and be better. Um, that said, the, the, the adversaries are, are not becoming less, um, less, less uh, active, they're becoming more active, right? So we just have to keep at it for, for 60. I'm not a security technology expert myself, so I, couldn't, I wouldn't guide exactly what, where the research should be. But um, there are, of course, plenty of tools that we haven't started work with yet, um, all the way up to quantum encryption, right? So, so I think there are many, many much big part of the research budgets and the research agenda going into academia, I think, will be on these topics, I guess. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I'd just maybe add that, you know, again, as much as we talk about 
uh, the fusion of AI, ML with wireless, uh, there's blockchain as well. And I think blockchain is going to play an increasingly bigger role in, in especially in internet of everything type applications. There has to be a different paradigm uh, type approach uh, to how we do security. And uh, I would encourage lots of, uh, there's lots of use cases and lots of potential research uh, areas that, that could be looked at in that space. Yeah, the previous speaker mentioned quantum, and yeah, that's a hot area, but uh, in its grandest scale, I don't, I don't see it moving much beyond very uh, infrastructure applications at this time, uh, but to me, it's a, it is a fascinating area, and and I, th I think it's worthy of, of research and exploration, but more from the perspective of what elements of quantum can we pull out and maybe apply uh, meaningfully to wireless technologies in the 6G type timeframe. And something, Alan, you said earlier on these multi-tenant networks and new players coming into the field, isn't that something which likely is going to increase these um, security threats and, and, and what to do there? Well, I, again, and this is this is I've seen some interest in companies in the Bay Area looking at uh, sort of blockchain, you know, sort of uh, blockchain-based uh, different type models for uh, um, creating peer-to-peer -peer wireless networks and and the like. And uh, um, yes, there is going to be um, you know many different players and other things. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but uh, I think it's. Uh, we're going to have to get out the box a little bit and uh, come up with uh, probably more IT based, you know, type paradigms uh, that we, we propagate into wireless in, in some shape or form. So wouldn't that also mean that uh, if, 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 let's say, this IT based thinking comes to wireless networks, that also, let's say, how the networks are built in the future and how they are operated and owned? shouldn't that start to resemble exactly what's happening in internet as well? Yeah. I I, I, I'll let somebody else speak. I've, I've, <laughs> there you go. Maybe Matt, uh, Matt, I can add a few uh, sentences. I think there are many uh, technology um, available. I mean, or, or we kind of... Uh, uh, For example, you, you mentioned this, uh, um, you know, a trust model, like uh, currently our network uh, architecture is built on the central uh, trust model. Essentially, we we assuming the, the operator runs the network and we trust the operator. So we build uh, our entire security architecture based on that assumption. But going forward, uh, as we said, there, there were many, um, uh, you know, stakeholder, maybe they were different uh, um, operator will run the network. Then uh, we need to think about uh, to, uh, you know, change our concept of a centralized trust model to the more distributed, uh, you know, multi multilateral trust model uh, so that you can incorporate, uh, the, you know, a third party um, endorsement and uh, or multi-party consensus uh, type of mechanism. So those are, uh, have been uh, lots of uh, research in the, in the academia. And I think it it's worth for us to take a look at in the, in the 6G. And also, I think one of the key things uh, for, for us, for 6G, because we're talking about the, you know, utilize uh, not only just uh, the um, algorithm, uh, but more use the data-driven uh, hybrid uh, this uh, uh, analytic model. Uh, then uh, the privacy, data privacy is one of the major uh, issue. So in that that domain, there's also lots of technology. Uh, you can actually uh, deprivatize the data so that uh, even though you utilize data, but you don't have the uh, you know uh, know the source of data. So those are technology we can uh, look into. Yeah. So, so now we are starting to talk about a little bit about network architectures and let's move a little bit forward. There's a lot of discussion these days about merging cellular and, and non-terrestrial networks in the future. And as we know, there are different, different um, operations ongoing in, in, in putting satellite coverage around the world. And now research community has been looking at already for quite some time different uh, airborne platforms to be key parts of future network architecture. So what are your, your views on non-terrestrial component as a part of 6G system? Aki, do you want to start? 
So in my short presentation, I say that uh, one of the seven directions of uh, uh, Japanese government uh, instated um, about uh, beyond 5G is uh, extra ultra cover coverage. And one of the, um, you know, the technology that we are, you know, very much expecting to see is, as Matt pointed out, uh, you know, uh, HAPS, uh, high altitude uh, platform stations, and also low, uh, you know, low orbit uh, uh, satellite communication. But uh, as you may know, that Japan is a small country, so investing the uh, money or funding to uh, this type of uh, infrastructure, it's hard to uh, uh, make a case. So here, the international collaboration comes into play, and we like to share the low orbit uh, satellite communication with other countries because. Uh, geo you know that the, the stationary uh, star, satellite can stay over you know only over japan but the low orbit uh, satellite can work it at a high speed over the earth so uh, i think it makes sense to like you know mega constellation of a low orbit shared with other countries so <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm trying to find a partner um especially in you know, you know, countries who are who have already developed this satellite communication. And also there are a bunch of people who are very much interested in this satellite, low orbit satellite communications because the outer coverage is very important uh, feature that people are looking into as a 6G technology. So in order to uh, meet that expectation, uh, we think that uh, non-terrestrial network uh, is something that we should invest on. And also combining the stellar network with uh, non terrestrial network all together because um, because people are carrying this stellar phone that can speak a 6G, a 5G or maybe 6G protocol, mobile protocol uh, in the future. But at the same time, people keep, should be able to use that everywhere, everywhere on earth. So yes. combining these uh, cellular and non terrestrial network that's okay. the key thing. Okay, I, 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 I pointed the question to you mainly because of something I remember from many years back. Uh, former NICT Communications Research Labs developed this stratospheric uh, communication platform concept of this uh, right. uh, balloon. So, so you must, and Japan has, has, has done a lot of research in that. Are you going to take it back into the agenda again now that we talk about 6G non-terrestrial? Right, so uh, we have several directions. I personally have uh, two projects about com combining 5G and satellite communication. But now, when we uh, did an experiment with 5G and uh, satellite communication, clearly the satellite communication link is, is not uh, enough for accommodating the 5G or maybe even 6G uh, network, the cellular network. So. What we have been discussing is that uh, we should uh, use our optical, you know, the satellite communication, which can go up, uh, up to like a five gigabit per sec uh, communication. So there uh, we have great opportunity to combine the current 5G or beyond 5G with the satellite communication. And even we can do a low orbit uh, satellite communication. So yes, uh, Mati, you are right that uh, we, I mean, NICT worked on a satellite communication in the past, but now we are getting a look at the new angle, new aspect on the satellite communication, combining optical with the satellite. Okay. And any, any, satellite. Do any other panelists have comments on non-terrestrial part and its importance to 6G? Yeah, uh, Mati, I think uh, uh, we think this is actually a good uh, area to to uh, to look into it uh, definitely, especially for this uh, uh, very low orbit ones, uh, which uh, there's the potential allow you to have a direct uh, you know um, communication from the uh, handset to the uh, to the satellite. Uh, I think th those area uh, rather you know the currently five G also has an NGN, but uh, mainly it's for the um, like uh, uh, 
you know, more, more relay type of uh, usage models. Huh? Uh, and also it's all depends on the, uh, the whether the economically it's, it's a viable solution. But uh, for us, it, it is important to look into it is because uh, we have a many area, uh, you know, it's hard to provide a good coverage. So we, we, we look into the, this thing to the more, more uh, complementary to the terrestrial network aspect, yeah. Nick also wanted to make a comment. Yeah, so inclusion is uh, important uh, for 6G. Inclusion in terms of uh, getting access to everybody in the globe uh, uh, for for digital services in a, in a uh, economic uh, way, uh, and uh, also to provide the services uh, in very remote uh, places. And uh, uh, those are good objectives for 6G. And then what has changed uh, from past uh, for concerning these low Earth orbit satellites? So the economics behind that has uh, dramatically changed. So. Now, now these satellite services uh, are possible with uh, uh, clearly less investment. Uh, so, so it's a more relevant question now than it was before. I, I would just, I would just add to that. Um, you know, I, again, I agree with the previous speakers, and I think paraphrasing all of them, it's like we've got to get the business model right, we've got to get the economics right uh, for it. And I think if there's going to be any generation where the economics might work for non-terrestrial networking, you know, um, then it is with uh, with six G. You know, I mean, I, I, my my first flirtation with. Uh, Satellite technology goes all the way back to 2G, uh, where I did some work years ago with TRW and the Iridium project and other things, and they, they were, on hind with hindsight, deeply flawed business models, uh, and you just had to look at the picture of uh, some lonely person in a desert with a satellite phone um, making phone calls, and you know, the business case doesn't really fly, you know, you got to have a lot of people in deserts uh, making phone calls, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it was a failed case. So whatever happens, you know, maybe it will happen in 6G. I, um, uh, I hope it does, uh, but the, the business model and economics are all about it. And let's not target lonely guys in deserts making phone calls. We are, we are getting close to our, our time, but I have one last point that I would like to raise here that we have been thinking in, in, in our, our 6G flagship. How much customization for critical vertical application areas do you think there will be room in 6G? Now those things have been solved in 5G through network slicing, but how much true radio concept customization will be there in 6G era? Any, any ideas or thoughts? I, I would say you kind of touched on this at the start. I think uh, there is there is so much further to go with cloud native service based architectures. You know, doing uh, you know cloud native technologies all the way through the stack, making everything almost configurable, orchestratable with AI technologies and, and what have you, and and. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I think in many ways and in so many uh, areas, we've, we've just scratched the surface with 5G. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and I say we can all, we'll only be able to push it so far with 5G before we start breaking things. And, and, and it will take us to 6G before we are able to go all the way with, uh, you know, um, you know, a, you know, m even much more advanced, uh, you know, sort of service-based architecture, cloud-native type models. I agree with Alan. I think the um, the uh, cloud-native and the programmability of everything means that speci specialization can be made uh, later in the in the integration process um, and using software from many places. I think this is also where the openness of the network really can start to pay off. Um, when we can integrate and still get performance from multiple um, ISVs and multiple providers and still build a stack that can, can give performance. That means that we can put in uh, special requirements if it is for government use or, 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 or transportation use or healthcare use. Um, so um, the technology development in the self and, and the software development and the flexibility of the interfaces will allow for much more. I think 5G has quite a bit already, 
but I agree, I, we, um, there is so much more to come using these technologies. So I think uh, before, 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 before local 5G and private 5G came out, um, so users are all given the services from the telecom companies. So that means that uh, customization is in, in, not in the hand of users, but uh, in the telecom operators and uh, vendors. So if uh, you listen to vertical players, you know, how they want to use mobile network and what kind of features uh, they would like, like uplink optimization and uh, higher customized security and all that encryption and all, all, all these uh, features that the users want. Maybe in six years, it's time to carefully listen to, you know, those uh, uh, mobile network users. And then customization capability comes into play in the infrastructure. So I'm not uh, against uh, building the highly programmable and customizable uh, infrastructure, but uh, as previous speakers pointed out, it's, uh, it's highly costly and uh, break things. And, but but uh, we have to listen to the, uh, it, it's time to uh, listen to the really users, how they want to want the 6G network to be like. Okay, so before we close the session, I would like everybody to state only one thing on top of your head, technology, which will make 6G reality. What is the technology that you would bet on? Let's start from Alan. Um, we talked a lot about uh, new spectrum and everything else. I think there's a lot of promise in uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces as being a critical enabling technology. I look at it as a, it's, a, it's the frontier of cloud native. Let's make the channel model software programmable too. Paying. Um, I think for us, is uh, we basically want to uh, make uh, the uh, 6G as a platform enabling the uh, um, AI computing, then plus the integrated sensing. That's uh, probably the way to go. But, uh, you know, the uh, we will continue to evolve the 5G capability, definitely. Thank you. Jan. Ecosystem like APIs and programmability and uh, getting the usage up. We haven't already we done that so far, I think. So that's where I will would want to see more. Miko. From research point of view, uh, certainly the machine learning based approaches are extremely interesting. So with 6 we have an opportunity to uh, design the uh, whole new system fundamentally right from the start uh, based on based on this. We don't yet know how far we want to go there, uh, but uh, it's a, a quite a fascinating research question. And finally, Aki. Yeah, I'm willing to believe that uh, 6G starts from a local 6G, private 6G. So we can uh, give uh, opportunity to uh, everyone and include everyone in the loop to uh, define the, what the 6G is. So local, frequency band intended for local 6G or private 6G. Uh, I think uh, this can uh, bring the uh, uh, interesting innovation. Thank you. I have to say that I agree with each one of you. So, so you got my votes. So that's, this closes this panel session number one. I think every, all the panelists and audience. audience uh, so I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining the panel. Thank you.